Hey guys, welcome into another episode of From the Wing. I am Christian Clark, the Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com on the Times Picayune. We are about two weeks out from the NBA draft. So that means on today's show, we're going to talk Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, Israel Palace. And I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about the NBA draft. We're going to do a little game at the end of the show where we just pick three prospects each who we would most want to see on this Pelicans roster. You know, just, just drafting for talent fit, just, just three guys we'd each want to add to the 2024, 2025 Pelicans and, you know, just put next to Zion moving forward. But before we get to that, we're going to do some Lakers coaching stuff and some NBA finals takes the Celtics are up 2-0. There was a lot of twists and turns in this Lakers coaching search in the past few days. Thursday, Woj comes in and says the Lakers are targeting Dan Hurley, who has won two national championships in a row at Connecticut to become the franchise's next coach and are preparing a massive long-term contract. And then on Monday, Woj says, Dan Hurley's turned down the Lakers' six-year, $70 million offer, and he's returning to UConn to chase a third straight national title. I have a lot of thoughts on this sequence of events that's kind of inside baseball-y stuff, but what did you make of the the Hurley four day saga there? So, the weirdest part of it to me is not that they interviewed him, but it, the weird part was when everybody went from having no idea he was going to be a candidate to now everyone knows that there's this massive offer coming, and so that feels like publicly like leverage to go back to like why it doesn't benefit the Lakers at all like to chase publicly a college coach, a college coach is failing the NBA all the time. And it's oh this massive deal. And then the massive deal comes up short of like people's expectations for what an NBA massive even looks like. This all feels really weird. And I like, I hate the Lakers as much as anybody. Uh, I think I've shared it on here uh, all the time. I feast on their doom, which is why I just couldn't believe that this was all happening because like this works for me, all of this being chaos and messy and like really like asking a bigger question about is LeBron going to leave is like, is that what this all actually is for is uh, portraying that LeBron's going to walk. And I just thought that served me and my joy too much. And so it can't possibly be true. And then I think the piece that I wasn't expecting from Woj's tweets on Hurley. I, I expected Hurley to re-up with UConn, but I was not prepared for him to say the, the actual contract offer that was turned down. I thought he was just going to like conveniently leave that out, and then we'd never actually be able to pin it on the Lakers that they made the offer to Hurley, and so like everybody gets out a little scot-free. Um, yeah, on, on one hand, I mean, six years, $70 million is an enormous amount of money to, yeah. to me and you, but... With what has happened in the NBA coaching market in the last 18 months, it's high, but that's not the highest. You know, I mean, Winhorst was framing this as almost a low ball offer. And I mean, it kind of is if you're the Lakers and you're trying to get this guy who whose stock has never been higher. You know, it seems like they they caught it could have gone a little bit higher. I mean, look, ultimately Hurley chose to go back to UConn for considerably less money than that. Let me just tell you my my read on this situation. This is just um, informed thoughts, my opinion. This is not reporting or anything. Don't aggravate There's, me. Yeah, we're not. Don't worry. We're not that big. <laughs> There's so it. much so much buzz about J.J. Redick to the Lakers. And J.J., it doesn't seem like he can make a move right now. He is working as a media member, covering the NBA Finals. He clearly does not want to take the focus away from the finals and make one of the stories. Oh, JJ Redick is becoming head coach of the Lakers. And so we're in this weird period where there's kind of a lull. I think with a lot of franchises and the high level NBA insiders, I think there are conversations of, well, who, do, I mean, you know, who's out there? Who, who do you think would be good? Those conversations happen. And I wouldn't be surprised if it happened with the Lakers, you know, like, the really powerful people there in Woj. I know for a fact it's happened with other franchises and and key decision makers. And in fact, I 
you know, had kind of heard that that Minnesota and Tim Connolly, uh, that was he was like a name on a list of like one high level insider told Minnesota, like, yeah, like these are the really accomplished people that you should keep an eye on. So I think these conversations happen where teams talk to the powerful insiders, the Wojas, the Shams, and they sometimes listen to advice. And my guess here is I think there was conversations between the Lakers and Woj. And I think, I think Woj probably pushed his guy a little bit. Woj famously wrote a book about Dan Hurley's father. If you watch him go on TV, that book is in the background of his shots. It is a very good book. I, I would not be surprised if Woj was pumping up his guy here and the Lakers thought so much of it that they looked at that and they said, Hey, Dan Hurley, like he's run some great offensive stuff at UConn. He's built a culture there. He can come in and build a program, even though our superstar is going to turn 40 years old next year. And maybe we're going to have to draft his son in the second round. I don't know. And I, I, I think they became convinced of this idea and, and really went hard to land Hurley. And Hurley ultimately decided to go back to UConn. So that all makes sense. But the, at the same time, if that's your decision-making process, like, don't we have a critical flaw here in terms of how you go about hiring coaches? And look, this, this works. This is great for me. This says the Lakers are impressionable and wave in the wind and like a guy and then change their mind and still have candidates and piss everybody off. And it's, it, this is messy. This is publicly messy and it does not make them look great. Um, it's fine. It's, it doesn't make them look terrible. Like they went after a coach that anybody would go after, but the college thing, especially after the John B lines and the Fred Hoybergs and like so many guys that have failed and famously failed and Hurley being like a pretty wild personality that controls the entire environment at UConn. That seems like a really weird fit for a team that's seemingly bringing back LeBron James. And so like a serious offer to him and a buy into like his style to me, like the only way that works, are you going to do a teardown and like, let him set the culture and get like the guys he wants, or is he going to do some weird like hybrid of I'm going to coach the LeBron team or like kind of the number one thing is like LeBron needs to like you. Yeah. Um, I mean, he would have to become more flexible if he was going to do this. I mean, un unquestionably. And, and the question is, could he, I don't know. I mean, I, I love Dan Hurley. I mean, I, I really do. If I was a college kid, he's like one of the guys I would want to play for. He also gets in verbal arguments with fans all the time. Like that does not, that does not scream yeah. temperament of an NBA coach. And in LA, maybe he could change, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe he could change, but yeah, I mean, to my point earlier, my read on what happened here, and this is just my guess, I think Woj almost functioned as their search firm. You know, a lot of these teams use search firms to find great candidates. The Pelicans did that when they hired David Griffin. Griff was one of the names the search firm turned back. So was Trajan Langdon, by the way. They interviewed both right. of those guys. But like, that's what I think happened here. I think Woj was effectively the Lakers search firm, and that was how this Hurley stuff happened. I've just, I mean, the Shams tweet about it, like, pumping up that it's JJ's to lose essentially. Um, and then leaving us with like JJ's going to work the finals before anything ramps up and then an offer getting made here. Like now I'm just waiting for like the wildest outcomes possible to be the end game here. Like Vince Goodwill saying today, like maybe JJ wouldn't want to do this and I'm like, all right, um, look, I don't even, they didn't even get to a point of offering JJ. It sounds like, they had a conversation. There hasn't been like a formal interview per se. Maybe we're parsing words there, but he's like holding off that stuff until after the finals. In the meantime, James Borrego had two in-person interviews and is the deepest into this process of anybody. Um, and is and in Cleveland this week talking to the Cavaliers about their head coaching job and appears to be an extremely serious candidate for that job. James Borrego is a guy who did a lot of great. He did. I don't want to say a lot of great work. He did some good work in Charlotte with a guard heavy offense. You know what? The Cavaliers have two, two lead guards. Yeah. So now I'm just waiting for like 
the greatest outcome possible. Since all this is going my favor and it's all making the Lakers look like impressionable and messy and like maybe a little cheap. Um, now I need them to like, uh, you know, really go off the map and I need Trajan to like fire or trade Monty Williams and Monty Williams to go coach the Lakers. That's what I need. That's if we're going to do, if this is going to be fan service specifically for me, give AD the coach he always wanted. Give him Monty back. 2025 unprotected first with Monty Williams's contract to get off it. <laughs> do you do you have to salary dump Monty Williams? Oh, can I so can we do a temperature check on 2025 pick right now? Oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. The Pelicans own the 2025. Yeah. Oh, I'm talking about Lakers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let's uh can we do a temperature check on the, the on the 2025 uh pick we just deferred into because right now on the table is a a coachless Lakers team that just had an incredibly healthy season that relies on a very very old player whose game has unquestionably altered and is limited now in ways like he is he's on a little bit of a diet in terms of when he can push the ball and when he can attack and all that. And oh he's got a player option that they've said for a long time he was going to decline one way or the other but originally said like oh yeah he's going to come back to LA like that kind of got out there but now there's there's at least like a question for me of like the hell's going on over in Philly and like it, yeah see it, you're on this I, I just huh? I don't see it as much just because Le LeBron his whole life is in LA. He still has I know. one of his sons in high school. I, know. I mean, you got it. Like imagine the sell to your wife of, well, yeah, I've won all these rings and I've accomplished all of this, but like, let's try to get one more and move to cold Philly, harsh Philly. You know, hey, I mean, JJ wanted to go to Philly. Why is it too good for LeBron? I don't think um, it's, too good it's just like he's he i mean he's just got to be really comfortable you know well i just i do wonder like it the, the, for the thing i'm not saying out loud that's that's making like the conjecture part here on the philly part is tyrese maxi deferred the opportunity to sign a max extension he waited and wrist injury this year tyrese maxi is a rich paul client and the scare the the curiosity there is like daryl morey just got like lambasted all year by James Harden for being a liar and untrustworthy person who ran James Harden out of town. Now Tyrese Maxey has this like implicit trust with Daryl Morey immediately after that. And there's this giant cap hold there. And we've the NBA conjecture for the most part for the last three months has been that that's for Paul George. But at the same time, the Clippers best outcome, the best reasonable outcome for the Clippers is to max him out and keep him. So if that happens, I mean, it just, I can't rule out that LeBron would chase one last title in the East with that team when he is exactly the thing that they need and they are that close to the top of the East and it's the East and not the West. So I'm just, it's, I don't know anything. I'm not reporting anything. I'm not a reporter. I'm not the reporter on this show. It's just weird to me that Maxi like, risk this and that rich paul let him risk it to give them that cap hold just for like oh we're gonna go try to court some guys the the, the last thing i'll say about all of this is i mean obviously the western conference is much much more difficult than the eastern conference but like with james borrego for instance i honestly feel like that could be a factor in his decision of it's just easier to go east than west I mean, it's way easier to make the playoffs if you got, I mean, clearly that Cavs roster has some talent. The Lakers roster has some talent. It's just so much easier in the East. Like, what is that Pacers team in the Western Conference this year? Where do they finish? How are we feeling about them? Is it way different than what we're feeling about them now? Quite possibly. It's just, you're you're playing the video game on, you know, a, a, a different level, a much easier level in the Eastern Conference than the Western Conference. And I do think that's like will be a factor for, you know, potentially in this in this Borrego thing. Not that he's, you know, like the Lakers have, have offered him. They've had a lot of time to do that and they haven't yet. But I think that matters just how how much easier the East is. To the original the original question I was trying to like come back to 
the 2025 Lakers pick. Do you feel you feel better about it today than you did a week ago? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I just I I just can't see LeBron leaving. I mean, his his body has got to just break down, you know, for for me to feel really good I, about it. Um, he's got the secret codes. Um, I mean, look, I it's not even his body breaking down. Like they just had an incredibly healthy season. AD never has those. Like not yeah. in the way he did last year. It's it's too early too. Like they they are gonna have three picks effectively to work with at at this NBA draft. And Polinka has indicated we kind of kept our powder dry to like try to make a big move this summer. And you know, LeBron, he's not a top five player anymore. He's still very good. AD is very good. He's not, you know, one of the best two bigs or anything like that. But like if they got a DeJounte Murray, I would feel a lot, I would feel better about them, you know? I would. I mean, I think that's reasonably speaking the only deal that they could make for what they're sending out. So, and I don't like. I'm I'm just going to continue to affirm the fact that I'm not a Murray fan. Um, I I like competitor and contract number and the fact that he is somewhat of a point guard who is large and has at least in the past been a good defender. Um, but other than that, I just don't I don't value him that much. Like if if you have to send out like what they have to send out, just so that folks are clear, if they're going to bring back like 20 mil or more, then somebody has got to value D'Lo. They, they need to want D'Lo and think those picks are, and the picks are worth something. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that's the move that's on the table for them if they want it. And I, all this other stuff, like they've put out all this stuff about like, Oh, they'd be a Mitchell player. They'd be a, maybe they'd be a Garland player because clutch, uh, like all this stuff. And none of that seems reasonable. If you ask yourself, if you're the other team, would I take this offer? No, you would just let them die on the vine. And that kind of leaves them with Murray. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I don't, I don't feel fantastic or anything because I've seen the Lakers repeatedly be incompetent and it's, they're still okay. You know, I mean, they just, there's such a high margin for error, generally speaking, in LA because of that. People just want to live in LA and play for the Lakers factor. It just saves them a little bit over and over. Not that they're going to be a contender or anything next year, but they're just not a, a normal franchise. You know, it's it's like a trust fund kid. It's like their mistakes don't count the same as your mistakes. And yet they don't have a coach. Hmm. And they're also hypothesizing like the fans are starting to talk about should Frank Vogel come back? Yeah. Love that. All right. Let's talk about the NBA finals. Boston Celtics are up 2 0. The Mavericks really struggling to score in the series. 89 points in game one, 98 points in game two. Dallas had a golden opportunity to even this thing in game two. Boston did not shoot the ball very well. Tatum, really rough shooting night. They were not able to do it. Boston just looks like the better team. And Porzingis is now questionable for game three. With the tendon thing, we'll see. You know that could that could potentially impact things, but you know Boston, heavy heavy favorite, obviously right now, two zero as the series shifts back to Dallas. What have you, your impressions been of this series so far? That I would like a game to get closer than this. Um, there are two finalses going on right now. The NHL finals are also happening, and they're the same series. The same thing is happening the overachieving team that just wiped the floor with everybody is playing against the team full of juggernaut uh, athletes positionally, and they're both getting waxed and the games aren't close. Um, I Look, I don't expect... I didn't expect to be super entertained in Boston because if they're going to lose, it's not they're not going to come out the gate that stacked with talent and get like beat up in Boston, like in the garden. That's not going to happen. So... I'm looking straight to game two and I'm like, okay, the question mark with Porzingis is always like, well, he might get hurt at some point, but I, the Celtics are still incredible at every position in ways that the Mavs aren't. Um, and yeah. I really don't, I don't really want to hear the nonsense about like, Oh, if this role player can play like Peyton Pritchard's not going to keep playing. It's the beginning of a series teams do this in the beginning of every series 
They try to see how deep they can go in their bench. Can I go to this 10th guy? Can I go to this ninth guy? By game three and game four, when it get, if it starts to get close, if there is a Mavs win, these these rotations will will go down. And when Pritchard was out there, he was getting attacked. Like this, that stuff will not continue. The big question mark here for Dallas is like, can you play Jaden Hardy at all? Like, probably not. So you have uh, Hardaway there that hasn't been the greatest player this year. I don't know how you play. I don't know how you don't lean just lean into minutes with him and not put Hardy out there ever and just like start trimming it down now because it has not looked good. Kyrie's been very, very bad. PJ has not, shocker, PJ has not been super, uh, super PJ scoring 20 points a game. They're just kind of running out of gas. Lively, um, Lively has looked Lively like a rookie worked. in the first two games of the series. Lively, yeah. you know, was fantastic all throughout the Western Conference side of the bracket and has looked like the 20 year old kid that he is so far in this series. I mean, did he, was it five fouls in a single quarter? Like it, 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 he got like three or four fouls in like rapid succession and was nearly fouled out of a game just trying to deal with Porzingis. Um, yeah. Porzingis has been incredible. I mean, he was so good in game one. How many how many plays have there been in the first two games where Porzingis gets a small switched on to him around the free throw line and just makes that contested jumper over the smaller guy and it feels backbreaking? Like there are so many of those in game one where I'm like, ah, like, man, that hurts so much. I mean, that's that's the type of that's the type of shot you repeatedly made that just kind of takes your your will away. So the Mavs can win games against the Celtics, but they need the games to be close. If the game gets close, like what we have not seen yet through two games is the bad decision maker closers play against the good decision maker, tough shot making closers. Mm. We there is there's been no close, and that's the game that the Mavs need for this to get interesting. Now we're going to Dallas. So we have at least a shot that this is going to happen. But like Dallas is also just outmanned. Like realistically speaking, Drew's having a fantastic series. Derek White is still Derek White. And those are, oh, the fourth and fifth options. Like it's it's just a little crazy right now. Um, and it's hard for them. The closest we've seen it get, Luca has that crazy run in game one in third quarter to cut it to eight. And like there's that was the one entertaining window <laughs> of this whole thing. And for the Celtics in this entire playoffs, like they just have not had to be challenged yet. And now, like, look, Porzingis is hurt. He may not play in game three, but salute to the the never aging or backwards aging Al Horford because they're only here and in this position because they were able to bank on a guy whose career should be ending right now that I feel like I have been watching play my entire life, like back to the Joakim Noah at Florida days, like his Florida teammate is coaching the Pelicans. Like that's this guy should not. He both looks the same age as he did when he came into the league. And he somehow, after I watched his hundred million dollar body fail him, he just takes like a respite year in OKC and he's entirely revived. He's just back. And they relied on him all year and they pivoted nightly and especially in back to backs between him and Porzingis. And then Cornette's just like the third big floating in there. And yeah, he's just the same Al Horford for the last three years that he wasn't for a little bit, but was the entire time before that. He's just, he's the, the guy that's not going to get talked about enough because Boston's so good that like he is a linchpin of how successful this year was. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, one of my takeaways watching this playoffs and this is a takeaway watching playoffs in the previous years, five outs of cheat code. It is when you can go Porzingis and, and even Horford to a degree, there's just so much room for everyone else. It just makes life so much easier on all your other players. Dallas, you know, can, can do that, but also with lively in there, it's a little bit different because you have Luca, who's one of the greatest pick and roll players ever and a lot threat to lively. And that's just, like so dynamic, but five out is a cheat code. And it's something I just keep coming back to for the Pelicans. It's like, I would just love to see Zion in a, in a five out attack. It's really tough 
to make that work. But I would love to see Zion and the Pels operate in, in five out spacing. And by the way, I know Zion can score a lot and efficiently when he has a plotting center. I've I've watched all the games. I'm just saying I think it, you know he could get it to a better rhythm and it'd be easier. I mean, I just I think he would look way better playing in that environment. And it's it's not easy to find that guy. But the Celtics have, you know, Brad Stevens has has made just some grand slam trades in in his time since transitioning from coach to the front office. I mean, Derek White trade was ridiculous. The Porzingis trade, you know, I identifying him after actually a pretty good year in Washington, you know, sending out Marcus Smart in in that three team deal. You know, I went back and read some of the reaction to that deal. I was like, people were not high on it at the time. You know, Zach Lowe, you know, one of the smartest people doing this who like knows the Celtics very well is like, eh, Marcus Smart was the team's best passer, you know, and they need that connection. And he felt like the team's heart and soul, emotional leader. And he wasn't alone. A lot of people were really lukewarm on this. I mean, probably even us, right? I mean, I think we talked about Porzingis last year. And we didn't love it. And now I look at it now. I'm like, this is why the Celtics are the Celtics. You know, they can just identify these guys who are like, if we bring him into our environment, he'll look way better. It's not just that though. Like the thing that every, the concern with Porzingis and we I've said it a couple of times because it just happened is he always gets hurt. And you had a guy that was deemed a unicorn in New York that then like that, that whole max concept was abandoned. He goes to, we get to Dallas and Dallas is just, we all thought it should work and would work. We thought that was the good bet. And Dallas was a nightmare. Like he was not happy. Him and Luca was not a thing that he seemingly wanted to do. Yeah. And it's crazy to think about now. Like, how is it possible that you guys did not work because you should have been the version of this that was impossible to stop? And instead that flames out horrifically and he goes to he goes to Washington for like Spencer Dinwiddie um and yeah it, he goes to Washington Washington doesn't matter they're a bad team there's no pressure on him whatsoever and Brad Beal is like on his way out and Porzingis does uh, has a nice year and is relatively healthy and hasn't been in several years so it's like oh Porzingis got healthy but we don't think he's gonna be healthy like right. he just was this one time. And Boston has like what they have again going into this offseason. They have this immaculate roster where they can insulate him from that. On back to backs, Al Horford can just play and be starting center, and Cornette can be the backup and he can take a night off. Yeah, exactly. They not I mean, not only was it a, a great buy low, but they they had the insurance policy. You know, they had the necessary insurance policy. To, to make this look really good too. And, and, Al Horf, and Al Horford, I think that's a really good point. I also think too, it's like when you just have a lot of past success, like the Celtics can go to these guys and Drew, like Drew Holiday will accept his role. Like Drew Holiday is just that type of guy. He can fit in any locker room. He gets along with everybody. But like the Celtics can go to Porzingis, be like, dude, we've been to the finals with our core. Like this works. And you need to be a complimentary piece. And what can he say, right? You know, like yeah. the like Luca is a, a great, great player, but the Mavs didn't really have that success with Luca to point to. It's like, what can Porzingis say? It's like, yes, this this does. It's proven to work. So you, you just you have to accept your role. And I think we've talked about that with the Pelicans. It's like with the Zion stuff. It's not like they could go to him in 2019 and be like, hey, look, we have a 10 year track record of doing things the right way. You know, I think I think that stuff do, does matter. A history of doing things the right way and success to to sell players to get them to buy in. Yeah, that's um, and that's also like that's going to be like small market versus large market versus historic market. Like they, there's history there, and you like you could sell it before it happened with this core that like, hey, we know how to do this right. Like we have a reputation here, and that like. I hate this part of the NBA conversations, but this is how people around the league talk about all these franchises. Like we're, we're never going to stop saying that the Miami heat can just like cobble some stuff together and go back to the finals. We're never going to stop saying that the Spurs could like 
land a player and get to the Western Conference Finals early with Wemby because Pop is a legend. We're never going to stop doing that. We're never going to stop believing that Golden State can like trade their way out of one thing and Steph can be right back because it's like what we saw before. Even though we saw basically every 30 plus former all-star flame out in playoffs this year or, or not get there. So interesting crossroads we're at right now. Um, I think the biggest part of that bet too with Boston, like it's such a weird confluence of issues because they gave up on having like the lead guard and just continuously challenged Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown to have more responsibility. They add in Derek white, like Derek white was not this like crazy person, like this crazy thing to see. I think a lot of people would have liked to have him and it worked out immensely there because like he's hyper glue. And now he's like my least favorite dude for people to comp draft prospects to. Um, but he was in for the Spurs when the Spurs didn't matter next to, to DeJounte Murray. He was a guy who was running the point a lot of the time, defending really, really well, passing really, really well for a team that didn't matter and that couldn't finish plays. And the one thing that was inconsistent the whole time he was at the Spurs was he was willing to take a lot of threes, but he missed them all. And it was, it wasn't horrific, but it wasn't great. It was like 30%. And so the question was like, man, if that could ever get righted or like, and the thing, the, like, there's a simple bet there. Like, are the Spurs bad? And if he's around better players, like, what does that do? Well, guess what guys turns out when you shoot open threes, they go in more. And so now he's a 40% three point shooter. And he looks like a legend in the making as like a, a sixth man guy. We never stop talking about for as long as he plays. So yeah, it just, everything worked out. Like even for drew, Hey, no, we don't need you to be the point guard. We, and, and we need you to shoot better too. And he does like Milwaukee was bailing on that asset. It's crazy. You know who I absolutely love? The crazy person, Joe Missoula. I am a Joe Maz stan. All his stuff, his friendship with Pep Guardiola, manager for Man City, showing showing the Celtics like Man City buildups and getting them to think of basketball like soccer. This is something I've, I believe for a long time. Like soccer is all about, we're not running really scripted plays. Like we're just kind of improvising and creating something out of nothing. And, you know, a lot of it is is flow and just like understanding how to read the game and manipulate space and these small advantages, you string these small advantages together. And if you do it, do that enough, all of a sudden there's a golden opportunity. And I think you can, there's some overlap there with basketball you can think about. And I think when you see the Celtics approach offensively, they do do a little bit of that. I, I think Joe Maz is like a creative, unique thinker. I just, I just appreciate a good psycho too. Like I love how much he, uh, he loves the town. I mean, he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't like to be, you know, boxed in. I don't know. I just, I just enjoy him. I just do. I'm partial look, to him. Give me weirdos. I look, I want characters. Like you, you mentioned Caitlin Clark for a half a second. Look, I need characters. I need good. I need bad. I need hated. I need loved. If you want me to be entertained by something, give me characters. Joe Maz is a character. I will take it. He has um, his convictions, and I think they're I, pretty good for the most part. I probably wouldn't. He probably wouldn't be my first coach to like my first choice to coach us. But like, I want him in the league. Like, I want him to. I want to hear his quotes. I want to see him be really strange with media um, <laughs> and give really, really off, off-topic answers. Um, I want all that stuff. I I can't resist a great opportunity to talk about soccer since that's what this podcast is about. And that's why people listen to it. Um, look, the, like for my friends who all hate soccer, soccer's really, it's really hard to score. Even like the, all the best teams in the league really, really struggle to score. And to amplify the point Christian was trying to make the, you're, you're trying to create cohesive movement and timing to open a window. That's not there yet where, you know, that the ball can get there before the defender does. And those windows open for a quarter of a second, a half a second, and the best players in the world know their guys well enough to know that the moment's coming 
before it actually happens. They see the pattern in front of them. They have that recognition. They map the floor and they say, oh, Porzingis is going to be open past this defender as soon as this happens. We hear guys talk about this all the time. The best players in the league can really do this. But a system that tells guys to think this way, at least in soccer, has in, is even trained guys that aren't the most elite passers and play identifiers to be successful in the same way. So if there's a through line there for Boston, like, does anybody look like a weak passer or like a weak identifier of advantages on the floor? Yeah, no. I mean, like scoring scoring a goal when it's 11 v. 11, the understanding of space is very important and moving without the ball is very important. And I think I think more basketball players would benefit if they understood those lessons. Like, as good as Brandon Ingram is, that's part of what kills me about his game is he just, he's not great at moving without the ball. And sometimes I wonder like how well he understands or, or values space. You know, it's just like, he's so good, but it's like, I think it limits him because if he doesn't have the ball in his hands, there's kind of a ceiling on what you can do offensively. But anyways, I, I like Joe Moss. He's, he's a crazy person. Yep. More crazy people. Give me all the crazy people. I need to replace all the dudes that aren't here anymore. I need, you know, I I'm, I'm down on Van Gundy's. I don't, I'm, I'm running short here. I just lost Bill Walton. I need more crazy in my NBA. All right, let's, let's finish up with some NBA draft stuff. The little exercise that we're going to do is three players that we could add to this Pelicans roster starting next season. It could be anyone on the board. And, you know, I'm sure the three players that we, we picked independently of each other, probably all guys who are like mocked in the top 14. I don't know how crazy you got with it. I mean, give you all the creative liberty, but I'm going to tell you, I was, I'm just going to advise fans that I was trying to be creative in the sense that I don't really want to overlap with Christian that much. I'm trying to think of ways to not talk about the same people. Um, there's one dude that's like, I just can't not say his name. So I'm going to say his name because I just, I, he, he's incredible. And like I would take him in a heartbeat. Um, and then I'm really, the third one is the one that like, I might pivot here, like right, like on screen, like while we're here, I might change my mind on the third one, but my first two are hammered in. All right. Well, I will, I will lead us off. I'm going to go three to one, meaning like this is the guy I third most want to add to this Pelicans roster moving forward and then, you know, finish up with the guy I'd, I'd most want to see next to Zion, I guess, and, and Trey Murphy and Herb. Those are, I'm just considering Zion, Trey Murphy and Herb, like the Pelicans core. Yep. And, you know, we can like maybe adjust that um, in a few weeks. We'll, we'll see. That's just what I'm considering the Pelicans core right now. And I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen, but number three on my list is the guy who very well might be the number one pick. Alex Saar, he is basically a wing in a center's body, seven feet tall, 225, seven foot four wingspan. He's got this really interesting background where he spent some time with Real Madrid, overtime elite, and then he played this past season with Perth in the Australian NBL. It's really easy to envision him as this, this five who switches everything, and we know how much this franchise, the Pelicans, values that specific quality. I just think... You know, defensively, I would love to plug him in at the five. You know, he's a guy who can roll uh, off the pick and roll and and finish well. He can put the ball on the floor a little bit. There's questions about, you know, his outside shot. It looks a, a little rigid to me. He was below 30%, but, like, there's hope that maybe he could develop that. But, you know, a, a guy with really impressive physical tools who plays hard, who has an interesting background, I, I like. I like him quite a bit. That's too easy for me. Um, I wanted to make this complicated on myself and, you know, like I said before, not be the same. Um, he's awesome. Like he, he athletically, we talked about this before. I think he's the best, the best swing on an athletic guy that could break a mold and be like an actual star in the way that we're normally talking about in the top five. All right. You want me to fire away with number three? Fire away. Backwards? All right. Stop me if you've heard this before, but I think this guy is still not getting talked about enough, and I just want an excuse to talk to talk about him again. So give me Deron Holmes again, because I wow. I just still don't think we're talking about him enough, and I want an excuse to talk about Deron Holmes because I just 
I hate everybody. Like there's so many players from like five to 18 that I just don't think have either a valuable upside. Like they all have problems. They all need something to pan out. And then even if the thing does pan out, it's like, okay, if it pans out, they might be this role player. That's like, eh, not really that important. Um, there's a ton of wings. All the wings are hyper flawed. So, and we have wings. So, you know, I'm just going to just salute again. Deron Holmes, I think is the most, he's the most bankable big for me, for the modern NBA, for what the NBA is right now, for what our team needs. He's the guy that I believe the most is going to walk onto an NBA floor and become a rotation player. I, 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 I just, like him. I, I like him. work. But six foot nine scares me. I mean, he is, he's pretty small for a center. He is, he is not big for a center. Like, do you have confidence next year? Deron Holmes, kept, he gets an offensive rebound at Jonas Valanciunas is down there, and Deron Holmes can just go up and score over Jonas Valanciunas, who, like we know, is not, you know, the, the best rim protector or anything, but he is big. I mean, Deron's got a little bit of everything, though. Like, he's got a lot of polish. Like, he's, he's not going to be like, like face up scorer guy. I'm not saying this is like some upside bet with him. I'm saying this class is really, really bad. And I'm really, really confident that that guy knows how to play basketball on both ends. And the thing, the question mark coming into this year that you wanted to see him add was shooting. And Oh, he did that pretty damn well. So I just, I do not see an actual flaw in his basketball game. We can debate the ceiling all day. I think a lot of these guys are going to fail. Like, I know we're going to do, I know everybody's saying this thing, oh, classes are bad and we're going to miss and some guys are going to be great. I don't think that the guys we're going to miss on are going to be like all stars. That's not what these guys are. There are not guys with that requisite talent level. So if I'm looking at stuff, like, I just like this guy a lot. I just think he's really, really good at basketball. I think he does a little bit of everything. He may very well always be a backup center, but Hey, the Celtics have Al Horford and uh, I'll take one. Okay. Okay. All right. Number two on my list is a guy. I know you like quite a bit. I'm, I'm curious if you have him on your list as well. Nikola Topic, uh, Serbian big ball handler, six foot seven, six foot five wingspan. He has a port partially torn ACL, so it seems like there's a pretty good chance he's going to miss, you know, a significant chunk of of this upcoming season. I just believe in him when I when I turn on the tape. I mean, I think he's got an ability to just get by people. I think there's a lot of craft is a finisher inside. He has not shot the three ball exceptionally well, but very free good free throw, throw shooter. Like, tell me about that free throw rate. Yeah. yeah, high 80s as a free throw shooter, which you know gives you some hope. I see shades, shades. I trust me. I'm not saying he's going to become this guy, but I see shades of Shea Gilgis Alexander, just in terms of a huge guy who gets by people, but is not like you would consider this burner in terms of his speed, and then just craft around the rim. Of I understand timing. I understand. Angles. I know I understand how to decelerate and take these funky steps to free myself up and use my size to finish around the rim. I'm just betting on huge guy who can handle the ball and reads the floor pretty well. Oh, so how do I do this? Because I want to talk about him, but I want to wait and talk about him because I have a number two. So I'm going to let, I'm just going to say, he, look, he looks like a pro. He looks like a real pro. He's been a pro since he was like 16. Um, he's a huge point guard. Um, but I'm going to jump to, I'm going to jump to my two. I think that's a great pick. I think that's a, a great pick at number two. My number two is one Reed Shepard. Um, and I'm going to say his name simply because like I'm doing something a little different here. These are who I think the best basketball players are. I think Reed Shepard is the best basketball player available in the first round. I think he knows exactly what he is. I think he is great at the things he is great at, and he is NBA great at the things he is great at. The He's a point-of-attack defender that can 
truly obliterate the net. Like can torch the net, the rim, the backboard, and the whole floor when he shoots. And it's running, falling. It's all the stuff you'd want from like an NBA role guy. Now, the only debate with him and why he's not going number one overall, he's short. He's he's really short. And all of the guards in this draft are short. That all the ones that are good um are really short. But if I'm yeah, trying Billy to Billy Henry is 120 pounds, right? <laughs> Yeah, basically, uh, maybe if you if you toss him in a pool. Um, so, yeah, I just I think Reed Shepard's the best basketball player. Um, and I think his ceiling is the most reasonable. Like, I think he is going to be the best version of himself in the NBA. And the whole debate is like, what team does he go to? What is he surrounded by? Can you hide his size? Like. I look at the Oklahoma City Thunder, and if you put that dude on that team, mm. it would shock me if Reed Shepard couldn't get into their starting lineup. It really would. Like I think he would find a way because the length and athleticism everywhere would would be able to cover it. I think we I think gone would be like the leaning on Isaiah Joe and stuff. I think Reed Shepard and I, and I would be terrified of OKC if he got there. I just think he's great. Um, wow. and he like, I can't undersell the defense. The defense is legitimately like, if you want to comp anybody to Derek white, that's a reasonable comp. This is probably that guy, but honestly, he's a better shooter coming out of college than Derek was. So yeah, yeah I mean, I just think I he's think, a great basketball player. I mean, obviously he can shoot the, the piss out of the basketball, but the, the defensive playmaking from a tiny little white guy is maybe the most interesting thing about him you just you don't see guys like him making like be defensive playmakers and and you know posting some of these steals and block numbers that he did it's just it's really unique it it's really unique i mean i like i i like him quite a bit i generally just you know value size and like Cal calvin booth had this thing in the that article koc did where he's like if you just look at like every single finals winner they're all huge. And I, I think there is some truth to that. And like you look at the Celtics, like they're they're all big and they're all strong. But but Reed, you know, might be this kind of outlier guy where like some of the stuff is so good that it's it's worth picking him despite how tall is he actually, like without shoes. Uh I think he's like he's six one without I think him and him and Dillingham were both six one without shoes, six three in shoes. And yeah. he doesn't have like he doesn't have a plus wingspan either. Like yeah. one thing Bronny James had going for him is he has like a six seventy wingspan and that would be helpful. But the guy who made the plays on tape was the shepherd kid. So yeah, I just, I think that dude's going to play in the NBA. I don't, I just think he's, I think he's going to find a way. I think again, this is more a commentary on what I believe this class is and what I think, like how good I think they are, how reasonable expectations for their ceilings are. I think a lot of these dudes are three to five years away from like reliable rotation player. Like I think they're that flawed and there are some guys, I think that's why the middle of the first round is like, is kind of appealing because the guys that you're betting on there are more traditional, like 15th, 16th pick bets like for the slot value and for what they are like a Tristan De Silva is you're buying, you're getting what you're buying. Like you, you're not yeah. expecting anything more than cam Johnson from him. And that's a great outcome. Yeah. The top end of the draft, it's a lot harder. So yeah, I just, I just can't ignore that. The guys at the top, like the Risa Shays and all that, like SAR is a, is a project. He's a, he, a wild athletic project that maybe he's Joel Embiid. I don't know, but well, no, he's, he's, he's not because he's way smaller than that, but but he's a he's a giant project, yeah. um, and like Risa Shea is the kind of the opposite. He's huge and he's kind of good at everything. But I don't think anybody actually believes there's like wild upside. It's just like, oh yeah, that's a really big dude who plays basketball real good that could just like plug in and work. How good he's going to be, I don't think anybody knows. So yeah, I'm just my first two picks are reflecting a th a theme here of like I'm I'm banking on these dudes. The Pelicans obviously have the 21st pick. Somebody joked to me that there are 29 guys going in the top 20 right now. You know, at, at, <laughs> we're about two weeks out. A lot of these guys and their agents think like, 
oh yeah, I'm going in the top 20. And this person joked to me, they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll get a lot of these guys in for workouts here in the next two weeks. It's been, it's been light so far because you know, everybody wants to be a lottery pick. Everyone wants, everyone wants to go in the top 20. All right. Number one on my board is an absolute giant. We spent a lot of time talking about the Colossus Zach E last week with Shemit Dua. Unfortunately, I am talking about the Colossus that Zach Eady faced in the national championship game this past year. Donovan Klingen, seven foot two center from Connecticut. Guy has a the same standing reach as Zach Eady, nine foot seven, a nine foot seven standing reach. Donovan Klingen can almost just put his arms in the air and hang on the rim. He's just got to do a little bunny hop and the rim's right there. Um, Donovan Klingen weighs 282 pounds. He didn't play a ton of minutes. Like he basically played half the game at Connecticut, but you know, despite only playing 23 minutes a game, he averaged two and a half blocks, like a lot to like about him as a rim protector. And the thing I like the most about Klingon is how he fit into that beautiful offensive machine that Connecticut ran. Like he would just, he would just control the ball and guys would whirl around him and cut and Klingon was comfortable just like firing some passes. I mean, not that he was putting the ball on the floor or anything, but I just think for a huge guy, he has some sense of how to play and how to pass a little bit. And, you know, I, I love that part of him. I think he's got some some IQ. Yeah, the 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 bet with Klingon, like he's not the fastest guy in the world, but the like you can have similar conversations to the ones that I was, you know, throwing out against uh, about Edie in terms of pace and everything. Like you can have those conversations about like what is the ceiling really? But he's a giant um with the giant wingspan you called out and his role increased as the year went on and you saw him doing more and he was successful at everything they asked him to do. So it's like you're betting on the fact that I'm going to change this guy's role some more. I'm going to keep asking him to do more and he's going to keep doing well with it. And if that's the case, then you're talking about a behemoth shot blocker. That's like playmaking. If, if that works out. Um, and I like, I don't want to hear anybody like any seven footer that doesn't already shoot a three in real games. I don't want to hear about them shooting a three. So like, I don't care that he shot threes in workouts. Um, but I think everything with him defensively, and his feel for the game and the increased role and in it going so well. I think all of that stuff uh, bodes really well for an NBA career. Um, and I think I would be stunned if he made it past seven. I think this is a weird draft and I think it's like, it's a fit thing. And there's only a few teams in the top seven that like would swing on him. And if they don't, then he like falls two spots, falls two spots. Um, but yeah, yeah. As good a bet as any can't argue with it. The body does worry me a little bit. Like Edie, the body doesn't really worry that about me that much, despite how massive he is. Like he just seems he's so well conditioned and he just seems like already so prepared to play a heavy workload. I worry about that a little bit more with Klingon. But look, I'm a I'm a big fan of like Klingon as a prospect. And yeah, he's he's drop big, you know. You know like maybe, maybe he's getting out to the level every now and then, but I mean, obviously you're not switching. He's just a drop big who is going to block a lot of shots around the rim, hopefully suck up a lot of rebounds and offensively. He's not doing anything crazy. He's not putting the ball on the floor. He's going to, you know, finish dunks when you set him up and he can pass a little bit. And I think that's pretty good. Yeah. The passing is the key um, for him to be hyper valuable at that position in the modern NBA at that size. That's the that's the piece for him that's like could project farther along than it is right now, and you feel good about it. And if a team feels good about it, they should take him because that's as bankable as anything else in here with bigs. All right, number two in Christian's program and number one on mine, Nikola Topic. I'm gonna go a little bit further here, and I, I'm kind of blown away a little bit that in a draft full of question marks and tiny guards and broken wings, like literally tiny guards, broken wings, bigs that either only have athletic potential or 
only have refined game and don't have great athletic potential because that's like this whole draft is that it's that stuff. This dude is the traditional upside bet. Like this is the NBA upside bet. This is the Euro guy with the psycho passing that's been a pro since he was a teenager. And like, I just can't do this to myself again. I can't tell myself to be worried about like, how is the professional Euro guy that doesn't look super fast? Like, how's it going to translate? He's huge. He's huge. His handle is really, really good. And his IQ and his ability to manipulate the floor, both with his handle and with his strength and finish on either side of the basket via a bunch of weird angles that all go in. I just, this is an undeniable prospect archetype that, I just don't understand, like, how is he not? I, I totally get Sar being number one on, like, if this works out, he has the athletic potential to be better than everybody in the class. I get it. Topic is probably, he's my favorite bet that, like, if he shoots a three, even reasonably well, this guy's a starting point guard in the NBA. And he's a giant starting point guard in the NBA. And I will throw out the caveat. He has a negative wingspan. So while he is giant, his arms are not crazy long. And I agree. Christian mentioned Shea Gilgis Alexander. The reason he's saying that is just watch him play a game. It's that style and his ability to get you in the air and to get you out of position because of knowing where to be and making plays out of that is what's going to remind you of Shea. What you're not going to see is Shea's defense. And Shea's wingspan. Uh, yeah. So I think like that has a lot to do. The shot, the 87%, 86% at the free throw line. I, like I'm convinced this dude is like, he's such a pro already as a point guard. People talk about Josh Giddy with him, like as the downfall outcome. I don't buy it because Giddy was a little bit of like a gimmick point guard when he was playing before he came to the NBA. He was not this seasoned half court guy. Go look at the passes this dude makes, and it's going to remind you of some scary names that, like, we're not going to comp him to, but, like, there's a guy playing in the finals right now that passes like him that, you know, also grew up playing in Europe. There's another dude from, from the same national team that has, like, crazy wild passes. That it, There's just, I can't let my eyes lie to me. That guy's making plays that are the highest, highest, highest level of the NBA point guards are making. Like that's the type of plays he's making. So I'm just not going to, I'm not going to sweat it over. Can he shoot the three? He does have a real problem in his jumper. I'll throw that out there too. His jumper is a little strange. It's probably because of the wingspan is a little unnatural. He kind of shoots from over his forehead and it's a weird wrist action where his rise is real strange. It's very stiff. And he's like just shooting with his wrist from over his head. It's a little wonky. Um, but the free throw line's great. All of the rest of the play is great and professionally minted. So it's hard. I'm hard pressed to believe that he will not figure it out enough. And I don't really care about the wingspan because I wasn't betting on him to be an incredible defender anyway. We're about two weeks out from the draft. It's it's just been really quiet the past few weeks. I think things are about to heat up. I, you should hear more, you know, about Ingram rumors. You should hear more about guys who've come in and, and worked out for the Pelicans. I think they've got a lot of workout scheduled the next two weeks. Zach Eady is one of those guys on the docket. The Pelicans have a lot to do, you know, and I, I think this is a really just interesting point for David Griffin because – He's he's gonna probably have to change this roster, right? Like this, you can't really. I guess you could run it back, but like it seems unlikely that they're gonna run it back. They very well could could change out a core piece, and he lost, you know, some people he really relied on, and in Trajan Langdon and Michael Blackstone, who both left for Detroit. So, you know, David Griffin's got a lot of important decisions to make. He's got a, I think they're working on like making a hire in the front office right now. You know, specifically someone who can work. Cap and strategy, Brago leaves. I mean, they're they're gonna have to add a, you know, a, a coach. So there's there's a lot that needs to be done, and some of the people who helped Griff get that stuff done are are gone now. So I think the Pelicans, you know, this is a critical few weeks for the team and and Griff. 
and I don't know if you can validate this at all, but I found I found a website that tracks workouts. And I think the list for us so far um, that and I know we were I know there's been a lot of guys that have like reportedly gotten second half of the first round promises and are like not taking like Deron Holmes is not working out for people. Um, and that's a little that one's weird. Because like, okay, who promised him what? Did somebody, did the Nuggets promise him like Zeke Najee's role? And that's why he's cool with this. Like, he's just like gonna go play for a contender. Um, like, I don't, I don't know what promise it needed to be to like not take workouts in the upper 20s and teens. Um, unless maybe he got a promise in the teens. Who knows? Um, but the names were Edie. Um, Schmidt mentioned Mogbo, and Mogbo was one of the names on the list. Um, Nick Cross from Tulane, Jalen Tyson, who's uh, he's from Cal. He's a big guard who can score, um, but he's really slow. And so, like, that's one of the other things I've learned not to let myself do anymore is like guys that can score as a guard in in the college level that are not fast, that are not like that have an athletic issue. I worry about. Uh, and the other name was Tyler Smith. The the ignite guy we touched on that should be like is a question mark guy around the 21 pick. So those are the names that are out there online. I don't know how like what level of veracity there is to that we know Edie. He's one that like got reported, uh, but I think we we know he's not scheduled for a while. So does that sound right? Is that right? That I'm my is that website like full of it? I don't know. Honestly, I mean, <laughs> I, I haven't. I really haven't talked that many specific names. I mean, all, I, all I've heard is they haven't hosted that many of them and it's going to pick up. And, and ED is one of those guys who's coming in. I think a couple of people have put that out. But I'm, I'm curious what they do. I mean, one of the things that they've, you know, I've I've kind of heard is, you know, it's, I mean, look, they could, they could go up. Like the Pelicans have optionality with good players who might be moved in future picks. But, you know, it's a, it's a very real possibility as well that, if a guy they they don't like at 21, they just go back and recoup some second round draft capital too, because the Pelicans right now do not have a second round pick until 2030. That is mostly due to the Devontae Graham trade. They did attach four second round picks to get off Devontae's contract at the 2023 trade deadline. They they owe four second round picks to the Spurs. So I think that's at least a possibility too of eh, we don't love anybody at 21. Let's go back and get a future second or something like that. Yeah, if the guards and Ware and Holmes are all like gone by 21, I really wouldn't want to make any of those bets if I'm them. So like I would feel a lot better about like going back a handful of picks and taking like the same level of dude that's just like my flavor and yeah, getting the seconds because we ain't got none uh, for a long time. Now, I hate seconds and don't care about them at all uh, and don't think that they're like worth talking about near as much as people talk about them, but we don't have any for a long time. So Getting some back and moving back and taking a guy that you're just as happy with at 21 as you are at 28 or 29, like totally makes sense. My favorite Pelican was taken 35th. 35th. Herb Jones. Oh, that, I'm never going to remember. You're never going to get me to remember like the number of picks unless a dude went like top five. Never going to remember. All right, Adam. We will convene next week. Some more draft stuff. Hopefully there will be some news on Borrego by then. This is kind of dragged out for a while. I think we're going to have a lot more to talk about. I appreciate you doing this, buddy, and we'll talk again soon.